that have been following us through will have um, realised that we're been working our way through the Book of Acts. We're into Acts chapter 16, just towards the tail end of Acts chapter 16. And uh, hopefully we'll finish our study in Acts chapter 16 and move into Acts chapter 17 this afternoon as God would give us um, help. So we do trust that uh, the time that we'll spend considering these verses might indeed be a, a blessing and um, an encouragement. Um, so Dad kind of concluded his um, ministry last week um, up to verse 34. Um, remember, these were the events in the, the Philippian jailer's life. Remember that man who uh, had been put responsible for guarding Paul and Silas. They had been arrested for uh, preaching and showing forth the way of salvation, and they had been imprisoned for that. And this gentleman had been given responsibility for um, and ensuring their safety and keeping them safe. And he had done so by taking them into the innermost part of the prison, remember, and he had put their feet in the stocks and 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 and, and he was doing his, his very utmost to ensure the safety of the prisoners that had been placed under his charge. And we remember the events that God produced on that night. Um, we remember the earthquake that shook the prison walls and and, and broke the, the stocks and the chains that bound these prisoners. And we were reminded last week how this uh, Philippian jailer was at the very point of taking his own life when Paul spoke into his circumstances. And, and we remember he comes and he asks that most pertinent of questions, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And we remember the, the reply of the apostle uh, Paul on that occasion, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And there in the prison cell, uh, that man um, repented of his sins and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as his saviour. And he experienced the wonderful salvation that Paul and Silas had been broadcasting on the streets of Philippi earlier that day. And, and, and uh, there is a great change is wrought in the man's life. And, and Dad touched on that as well. Uh, last week, he taught the change in this man's life and similarly the change that had been brought about in the young demon-possessed woman's life. And then uh, similarly, there had been a change brought about in the life of Lydia. And, and, and God always brings about a change in our lives. And this man's life has changed. And the one who had bound them in the stocks and, and the one who had no doubt inflicted harm upon them was now uh, ministering to their needs, providing nourishment and sustenance for them. Uh, and and providing healing for their wounds and, and taking care of them. And, and there's a little uh, phrase in verse 34 um, that just says this. He, says, he, says he, brought, he set food before them and he rejoiced greatly. He rejoiced greatly. Uh, you know, isn't it wonderful? That, that man, no doubt, had no inclination that when he started his shift that night, when he was given the task of of, of looking after these prisoners. He had no uh, inclination of the events that were going to unfold in the, in the hours that lay ahead of him. Uh, and God intervenes in his life in such a dramatic way. Uh, and God literally shakes the earth in order to get this man's attention, in order to bring this man to a knowledge of himself. And it says there that there was great rejoicing, rejoicing in the hearts of of the Philippian jailer, no doubt, and rejoicing in the heart of his family who, who subsequently heard the message of salvation and responded in faith and collectively together they were baptized in obedience to the Lord Jesus. But great rejoicing in the heart of Paul and Silas as they see another soul converted, as they see another soul saved. And there is great rejoicing. And here at the very start of the Philippian church, there is rejoicing in the heart of, of this man and rejoicing in the heart of the apostles. And we'll remember at a later date, Paul will write to these little group of Christians, won't he? And what is the exhortation that he gives them over and over and over again through that little book in, in Philippians? It's the, it's the idea that they have to rejoice, rejoice always, rejoice always. And, and we think how that little letter that he writes is, is, is peppered with phrases about joy and rejoicing. And here we see at the very commencement of it all, there is rejoicing in the heart of this man and his family and rejoicing in the heart of these uh, the apostles as they see this precious soul converted to Christ. And, you know, wouldn't it be a, 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 a real joy to our hearts as we hear of people being saved? Uh, wouldn't it be a bring real joy to our hearts as we see lives transformed, as we see uh, old people uh, changed into new creations uh, and we indeed see uh, churches 
established uh, and there's rejoicing at the very commencement of the uh, of the infant church in, in Philippi as there's rejoicing in the home of the Philippian jailer over the work that God has done in his life. But not only do we have the idea of rejoicing in verse 34, but we've got the idea of the release in verse 35. You know, sometimes when we read through this, this passage of scripture, we, we almost think that God sent the earthquake in order to liberate Paul and Silas from their bondage. You know, they were there uh, as a result of their faithfulness to him. And we almost think that God intervenes in this miraculous way in order to provide a release for them. But he doesn't, does he? These men, you know, the, the earthquake was not sent in order to provide physical freedom for Paul and Silas from their prison uh, bondage, but rather the earthquake was sent in order to liberate this poor man from his sin. And God moves in a mighty way, not to liberate his servants from their oppression, but he moves in a miraculous way in order to deliver this man from the bondage of Satan himself. And Paul and Silas, although they have a reprieve, and although they are taken uh, from the prison and they're taken to the, the, uh, the, the, the jailer's home, they return to the prison. You know, they, they would have potentially have been well within their rights to have made their escape. After all, they had been prisoned, imprisoned wrongfully, and, and we learn of that uh, in, the, in the next few verses. They, they had been taken and they had been placed into this innermost prison uh, without any real evidence of what they had done wrong. And so they would have been well within their rights to have, uh, to have, uh, to have escaped at that time. But Paul and Silas have an appreciation that their freedom, their freedom is not as important as the life of the Philippian jailer. Because if the Philippian jailer had, had failed to live up to the task that had been given to him, despite the, despite the earthquake that had shaken the, the, the prison, if these men had sought their freedom at that time and they had fled from the scene, then when the magistrates had come in the morning and had found that Paul and Silas had disappeared, then the life of the Philippian jailer would have been taken, it would have been cut short. And Paul and Silas had an appreciation of that and they valued the life of the Philippian jailer more than they valued their own freedom. They esteemed, they esteemed the Philippian jailer greater than themselves. This one who had started the evening, an enemy, was now a brother in Christ, and they valued his life. And they weren't going to take their freedom. And they weren't going to take early release. They were going to go willingly from the prison to, um, to, the, to the jailer's home, and then they would be returned back to the prison. And the purpose of the earthquake was not to provide them with a way of escape, but it was to provide this, this, the, this, the Philippian jailer with a means of salvation. And Paul and Silas are not released as a result of the earthquake. And they're taken back and they're put into bondage and they go there willingly because they value the life of the Philippian jailer more than they value their own freedom. And brothers and sisters, that is a challenge, isn't it? It's a very simple lesson that we can pick out of this as to how much we value others above ourselves. Would we have sought the first opportunity for liberty? Would we have used the earthquake that God had provided as a means for our own escape, regardless of the consequences that that would have had on this poor man and, and, and the subsequent consequence that that would have had on his family? Or I wonder, do we esteem others greater than ourselves? And they valued the life of that dear man more valuable than their own freedom. And they were willing to go back into bondage. And they were willing to go back into the innermost prison until the release uh, warrant would come from the magistrates. And that comes in verse 35. And it says that they came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen and they said, release those men. And so we have the release and then we not only have the release, but I was thinking we've got the refusal. Because the jailer in verse 36, he reports uh, these words to Paul. Uh, he said, the, the chief magistrates have sent to release you, therefore come out now and go in peace. And, and you know, you, you would have thought that, uh, that Paul, and, Paul and Silas wouldn't have needed to have been told twice. You would have thought that they would have jumped at the opportunity to be free, and yet Paul and Silas refused to be 
released under such circumstances. And they exert their, their rights, as it were, their, their, their civil rights as those who were Roman citizens. And they express to, the, to those who had come to in order to release them, they, they, they said, well, you've, you've done it. It's, they want to just to release this secretly. It says they, they, they punished us openly. And now they want us just to kind of slink away quietly. And they want us just to, as if, just disappear. He said they've done it publicly, humiliated us publicly. They've beaten us in public without trial. And he says we're Romans. And he says, and they've thrown us into prison and now they're sending us away secretly. He says, no, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. See, I don't know why the magistrates decided the, the, the following day that they were going to release them. You know, sometimes it was just a, uh, it was just a means of exerting their authority. And, and one day they would arrest and imprison and beat, and the next day they would just let them go again in order to, uh, to show the, the evidence of the authority that they had and in order to place into the hearts of those under their control a fear uh, of the dominance of the, Ro of the Romans. And, and, and that's perhaps what they were just trying to do just trying to keep them for one night, just to show their dominance. And Paul is not uh, afraid of that. And Paul says, he says, you, you publicly beat us and you publicly uh, put us into prison. He said, we're Roman citizens. He said, and if they want us to release us, then they says they'll come, uh, they'll come down themselves and they'll bring us out. A refusal. You know, I question, why, why did Paul and and Silas, wait till now, before making this revelation that they were that they were Roman citizens. See, Paul had been born in, a, in, in Tarsus, Tarsus, which was a free city, and therefore, as a as a, as a citizen of, of Tarsus, he had he had the rights of a of a Roman citizen. And and I wonder why Paul would have waited until now. But why did he not make that revelation the day before when when he was arrested? But why did he not make that revelation the day before when he was being beaten and when he was being taken down into prison? Why did he not make the revelation then that he was a Roman citizen and what they were doing was unlawful? Because the reality is this, there was something that was more important than his rights. And if he had chosen to exert his rights a day earlier, if he had chosen to make it known to those who were oppressing him and who were beating him and who were imprisoning him that he was a Roman citizen, then he would never have found himself in the deepest, darkest dungeon in Philippi. And if he'd never found himself there, then there would never have needed to be an earthquake. And if there had never been an earthquake, then the Philippian jailer would, they might never have been converted. And so what Paul does here is that he withholds this information. He doesn't exert his rights at the first opportunity, because, because there's a purpose behind it. God has a purpose in his suffering. God has a purpose in his imprisonment and his beating. And that is that there will be a wonderful conversion of a Philippian jailer and subsequently his family. You know, brothers and sisters, that's a challenge, isn't it, to you and I? We live in a society and it's all about our rights, isn't it? It's all about ensuring that we are not trampled on. It's all about ensuring that that our rights are maintained, our human rights, our human dignities are maintained. Brothers and sisters, perhaps God wants us to relinquish our rights in order that he might do a work of salvation in someone's hearts. And perhaps, brothers and sisters, you, you feel as if your rights have been taken away, as if your human rights have been trampled on. Just sit back for a moment and wonder what is God doing in the process of that? It was just here in, in Acts chapter 16. There is a refusal by Peter to leave and making it known that he's a Roman citizen. But he does it after the event in the Philippian jail when this man is gloriously converted. And brothers and sisters, let us be cautious that we don't just want our rights. And we don't want our human rights to be maintained and preserved because God may well want us to relinquish our human rights and our natural rights in order that he might do a work in someone else's life. And so Paul and, Paul and Silas make this revelation that they're Roman citizens, they're Roman citizens. You know, another reason that they may well have chosen to do it at this point is because 
because some of the others that they travelled with and some of the others that they preached with weren't Roman citizens. And you know, the reality is this, perhaps if Paul and Silas had made that known earlier, then these other companions of theirs who, were, who weren't Roman citizens, they may have faced the, the brunt of the, the wrath of those who were imprisoning them. And so rather than allow brothers, other brothers to suffer for the sake of Christ, Paul and Silas keep their mouths shut. And Paul and Silas um, relinquish their rights in order to preserve potentially the, the, the safety of their brothers and sisters, and certainly to see the work of God done in a miraculous way and in the prison dungeon. And so Paul refuses here, refuses. And some might think it odd, and some might think it strange that he would, he would bother telling them at all. Why tell them now that he was a Roman citizen? Why not just leave the prison uh, cell? Why not just go on his way? But... Uh, I think it was really to demonstrate grace, because you see there was that there, there was uh, consequences for those who had tried a Roman citizen without uh, proper evidence and, and without doing it the proper way. And when these men heard that that Paul was a Roman citizen, they were afraid because there was consequences for them, because they could be judged for what they had done wrong. They could be held accountable for uh, for the way in which they had treated Paul and Silas. And they're coming and they're uh, beseeching them, aren't they? They're appealing them. They're begging them to leave the city in verse 39. Because they know that there, there's potential consequences for, for how they've treated Paul and, and Paul and Silas. You know, Paul and Silas, they don't, they don't stamp their feet, don't they? Uh, they? They don't stand their ground and, and, and make sure that these uh, magistrates and these police officers who have been responsible for treating them the way they did were, were held to account. There's grace, I think, demonstrated in Paul and Silas. And yes, they make it known to them that what they did was wrong. Uh, and they make it known to them that the way in which they acted towards them was wrong and it was unlawful. But when these men come and these men beseech them and appeal to them and beg them to leave, Paul and Barnabas, as it were, just draw a line in the sand, don't they? They demonstrate grace. They don't want to see these individuals held to account for what they've done wrong. They demonstrate grace because that is the grace that they had been shown. They had been shown grace by God. They had experienced forgiveness by God. They hadn't been held to account by God the way they ought to have been. And dear brothers and sisters, every one of us, Saved by the grace of God this afternoon, we, we have not been held to account by God for the wrong things that we've done. God has been gracious to us. God has been kind to us. And all oh, brothers and sisters, that we may demonstrate that same grace and that same kindness. You think of those, uh, the parable in the, in, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ told about that man who had a, a large debt and, and remember how the, the debt was wiped clean. And then he, he goes out and he finds someone who owed him a much smaller day and he holds him to account for it, doesn't he? And, and he wants him imprisoned and he wants him to pay. And the Lord Jesus Christ teaches us in that parable that, that we, have been, we have been forgiven much and therefore we have to forgive much. Indeed, the very prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ would instruct the disciples to pray when they could ask him that they would teach them to pray, he could say, forgive us our sins, even as we forgive those who sin against us. And Paul, and Bar Paul and Silas, I believe, just demonstrate a spirit of forgiveness, a spirit of grace to these men. And yes, they let them know that they've been wronged, but, but they're not going to hold them to account for that. Brothers and sisters, I wonder, are we guilty of holding to account those who have wronged us? And ensuring our rights are maintained and our rights are, are respected. And ensuring that we are not uh, hurt in, in any way um, un unrightful, unrighteously. Or I wonder, brothers and sisters, do we, do we not hold against folks that have sinned against us? And I think it's a demonstration of grace here by, by Paul and by Silas. And they're requested to leave, they're requested to leave the city. And, and, and they will do that. They will accept the request that is made of them by these magistrates and these officers. But, but before they, before they, they commit to leaving the city behind. They return, don't they? They return to Lydia's house. And that's what we read of in verse 40. It says, they went out of the prison and they entered the house of Lydia. 
And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them. And then they departed. And yeah, they were going to do what they'd been asked to do. They were going to do what they had been beseeched to do, what they had been compelled to do, what they had been begged to do, they were going to do, but not before they had returned. Returned to the home of Lydia. And met there in the home, the brethren, those who had been converted during their time there. And no doubt Paul and, Paul and Silas had, had told the Philippian jailer about the, the home of Lydia. A home where they could go and they would find people of a like mind as themselves. And, and no doubt when Paul was there and returning to the home of Lydia, that there in the home is sat the Philippian jailer and his family. And, and Lydia and her family. And perhaps that young maid whose life had been so dramatically changed, perhaps she sat there and others are sat there. And Paul gathers together, before he departs the city, gathers together that he might encourage them. It might encourage them. You know, if anybody was needing encouragement, you would think, surely it must be Paul. He's just spent a night in the, in, in, in the prison. He's just been through an earthquake. He's just been uh, wrongfully uh, accused and wrongfully treated. Surely if anybody needs encouragement, it's Paul that needs to be encouraged. But here's Paul, and again, he's given no thought for himself. He's not there to have his ego rubbed. He's not there to have uh, others give him the encouragement that he needs. He's there to give encouragement to, to others and he encourages that little group of Christians and he strengthens them and, and he, uh, and he uh, just wants to lift them up. And brothers and sisters, isn't that a good, uh, a good thing for us to be engaged in, to be engaged in encouraging, to be encouraging one another and just lifting one another. We, we, you know, we live in discouraging times. We live in times when it's so easy to get discouraged and to be downcast, so easy to be uh, despondent and despairing. And isn't it good if we can just have those among us who are able to come in and just to encourage us, just to lift us up and just to uh, just to lift up the hands that are that are hanging down and the feeble knees and to bring them strength and just to be an encourager. Paul was an encourager. And before he'll leave the city, he ensures that he goes back to Lydia's house meets with the brethren and he encourages them. He encourages them. And then he does leave. It's interesting, isn't it? That he does, they don't all leave together. You know, it's, it's evident from the text, isn't it? When we come into chapter 17 and, and uh, Luke writes and he says, now when they had travelled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. You know, prior to this in, in, in the text in Philipp, uh, in chapter 16, he's writing about we. Luke is included in those who are making, uh, who arrived in, Phil in Philippi, but he's not including himself in those who left to go to Thessalonica. P Luke is left behind. Luke remains in Philippi. And, and Luke is left there with a purpose that he would continue what Paul had started. He would encourage, continue to encourage the saints. He would continue to build them up. In a later epistle, Paul will write, well, and he'll refer to Luke, and he'll say that Luke is his fellow worker. He's a fellow worker. See, the, the, the work that Paul did, it wasn't a one-man band. Uh, 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 not everything hinged on Paul. There was others who were involved in the work. And here at Philippi, Luke remains, and he remains with the purpose of encouraging, exhorting, building up that little group of Christians and, and, and exhorting them. And he remains. And God has got his men for his work, hasn't he? And although Paul is going to have to leave, and Silas is going to have to leave, and Timothy is going to have to leave, Luke remains behind in order that he might just continue the work there in Philippi. And they will be reunited further down the line. And we'll read of that as we go through the book of Acts when they return to Philippi and they'll be reunited together again. But here for, these, uh, for this period of time, Luke is going to leave the band of men and he's going to stay in Philippi and he's going to encourage and he's going to build up and he's going to strengthen the church. And isn't it good that you know, God is not limited to one man or one group of men, but God has got his workers. Not only was Luke a, a co-worker of, of, of Paul's, but he was a, a co-worker of God, wasn't he? And Luke is used there in Philippi for the, the establishment and the blessing of that little church. And so Luke remains in Philippi and they travel Paul and Silas and Timothy travel down to Thessalonica 
uh, where there is a synagogue, where there is a synagogue of the Jews. It's interesting, isn't it, that again these little places around about uh, on the way down to Thessalonica from Philippi are mentioned, but but they're only just given a glancing comment, aren't they? Uh, literally just that these were places that perhaps provided an overnight stay for Paul as he went to Amphipolis, which was about 30 miles or so uh, from, uh, from Philippi, and then a further 30-odd miles down to uh, Apollonia, where they would again have another overnight, and then they would go from there to uh, Thessalonica, about 60-odd miles, so about 100 miles between Philippi and Thessalonica. Uh, but but these, are, these places are just a, just a flying visit. Uh, well, no, there's no record of any work that was done there. There's no record of any preaching or teaching. Uh, it was just that these were places that provided a, 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 an overnight rest for the apostle and his, uh, and his co-workers. Because there was a strategy in Paul's uh, ministry. There was a strategy in his, um, in his missionary journeys. And, and he's, he's working towards major uh, towns, major cities. He's He's, he's making his way towards places of influence, places of commerce, places of trade. And that's what Philippi was. And here he's going down into Thessalonica, and later on he'll go to Berea, and down into Athens later on in the chapter. And it's these key places that Paul is going to. He's working towards a strategy of reaching in to where there's a heavily populated area in order to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with the hope that when the work is established in these major areas, then from there they will sound out the gospel to these other places. And perhaps after the gospel has reached Thessalonica, and perhaps after souls have been saved there, and church has been established there, then that church would reach out to places like Amphipolis and Apollonia. But Paul has a strategy. Paul has a strategy. Brothers and sisters, you know, I wonder if we've got a strategy in our Outreach for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, have we ha, have we got a, a a a formula or a or a plan? You know, I know we very much need to be relying on the Holy Spirit, and I'm not seeking to um, to detract from that in any way. But I wonder, have we got a have we got a strategy for reaching our communities? Have have we got a a vision as to how we can best reach? The, 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 the majority of people with the gospel is there key places that we think that we, we need to target in order that we may share the gospel there. And then when the gospel is shared there and a work is done there, then that can then spread. You know, brothers and sisters, I think we need to have a strategy. The apostle Paul had a strategy. And he gave consideration as to how what was going to be the most effective means of evangelism. How were the, the, the most amount of people going to be reached in the, the shortest time possible in order that the gospel might grow, the church might grow? There was a strategy involved in that. There was a vision. You remember the, 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 the proverb, where there is no vision, the people perish. I wonder, brothers and sisters, do we have a vision? Locally, as in Auckin Lake, as a church, have we got a vision for this community? Auckin Lake and Cumnock and... and uh, and Ochiltree and Muirkirk and Mauchlin and Catherine and you know I wonder is there a strategy or I wonder are we just kind of going through the same old motions without really giving any thought to things and I know we've already made reference to the fact that we've got to we've got to be dependent on the Holy Spirit and we learned that last week didn't we because Paul determined to go to a certain place and the Holy Spirit forbade them and he, he sought to go somewhere else and again he was stopped by the Holy Spirit and so we do need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit but I think we also need to use common sense and we need to have a strategy in mind in order for reaching out Paul had a strategy and his strategy was to go from Philippi down to Thessalonica another major hub another major city in order that he might take the gospel there and in order that he might share it in a strategic way. Brothers and sisters, we need to have a strategy. You know, sometimes we look at others and they've got strategies and we can sometimes be a bit con condemnatory of it. As they think of their five-year plan and their 10-year plan and their 15-year plan, as they want to see their church grow and expand and see church plants. Brothers and sisters, I trust that we would have that same vision. I trust that I would have that same vision and that we would have a strategy in order to see that vision come to fruition. And so Paul has a strategy. There's a rationale behind the decisions that he makes as he makes his way from uh, Philippi down to Thessalonica. 
And he goes where there is a where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom in verse 2, he went to them and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the scriptures. See, Paul had a routine as well, didn't he? He had a routine. We find that repeatedly. Where does Paul go uh, when, he, when he arrives in a new place? He goes to the synagogue. He goes to where there are those gathered who, who have an interest in God and, and in God's word. And he goes there and he, and, he, and he takes the word of God there. He takes the message of Christ to the synagogue repeatedly goes there. We'll find that when we come to Berea later on in the chapter and later on in Athens, he goes to the synagogue. And Paul is a routine. He's a routine. And you know, I I don't think there's anything wrong with routine. You know, Paul followed that same habit in these various places that he visited. He went to the synagogue. And he taught the word of God there. And it's good to have routine. Paul was going to the Jew first. That was what he was, he knew the gospel would come to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And he goes and he gives them the opportunity in the Jewish synagogues to respond to the message. And he he goes there and he has his routine. Although he has his routine, there's spontaneity as well, isn't there? You know, I think there's got to be a balance, brothers and sisters, between the routine and the spontaneity. You will find that the synagogue is not the only place that the gospel is preached. Look back into the early chapters of Acts, and they're out in the open air, aren't they? Outside the temple, when they're preaching there. You remember in Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes down to the home of Cornelius, he, he preaches the gospel in the home, doesn't he? We've just seen that he has preached it in the uh, the riverside down there in, in, in Philippi, he's preached it in the prison cell in Philippi. He, he, he will preach it in the marketplace later on in Athens in this chapter. He preaches it on a ship. You know, you know there's, there's, a, there's an aspect of Paul's ministry that is routine. He goes to the, the, the synagogues, he goes to the Jews, he presents them with the word. But there's a spontaneity about Paul as well. There's a spontaneity. And brothers and sisters, I wonder if sometimes we become so used to the routine that we have given way to any spontaneity. And our routine is that we have a church service at this allotted time. And that is the purpose for that church service. And that is our outreach service. And that is our Bible teaching service. And that is our prayer service. And and we have routine. And there's nothing wrong with routine. And these things are all commended in the word of God. But I wonder sometimes if routine has, has... taken away any spontaneity. Paul used every opportunity to preach the word of God, although he had the routine of going to the the synagogues and and the the cities that he visited in order that he might present the word of God. And it's no different when he comes down to Thessalonica, he goes there and he goes to the the synagogue and and he enters there and he reasons with them. We've got Paul reasoning in verse uh, verse 2 of chapter 17, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. A hey, dialogue, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of dialogue here. In, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of answering and asking questions. And, you know, again, you know, I question our own hearts sometimes about our, our presentation of things. Our presentation is that, that we stand and, and we have our allotted time for, for preaching at people. And and very little time for them to engage or to question or to discuss. And there's an element of that that makes us perhaps feel uncomfortable. But that's what Paul was doing down there in the synagogue. It wasn't just him standing, preaching, preaching, preaching. But there was dialogue, open dialogue between, between these Jews in, in Thessalonica. And we'll discover later on in Athens that that's the same. He's, 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 he's having dialogue. He is, he is um, reasoning with them from the scriptures. And, and they're answering and asking questions. And there's an open dialogue. Brothers and sisters, does that type of environment make us feel a wee bit uncomfortable? I think it does. I would much rather, I'll be honest, I'd much rather have my half an hour where I get to stand on a platform and preach uh, to, to, to a, an undestructive uh, audience than to sit and, and have people ask questions and throw questions and, and give remark. And there's a sense in which that makes us feel at unease. But, but that was the... That was the the means that Paul used here in the synagogue to to reason with them from the scriptures. It's interesting that Paul brings them back to the scriptures, doesn't he? 
you know, his reasoning is not about his own experience. He's not there just to relay his testimony and the miraculous way that God has worked and, and the wonderful way that God has moved in his life and the transforming experience that he had on the on the Damascus Road. And, and you know, there are occasions when Paul will relate all that, but, but here when he gets to the synagogue, he's taking them to the scriptures and he's revealing to them from the scriptures that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying that this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And so he's there, reasoning with them. And where is he taking them to? He's taking them to the word of God. He's taking them to the word of God. He's explaining it. He's opening it up before them. He's presenting it to them as evidence. He's showing them from scripture, scriptures that they knew, scriptures that they had read, scriptures that they memorized. And Paul takes those scriptures and he reasons with them. And he opens it up before them and he presents it as evidence before them. And he says, the one that, you, you, that, that is written about in the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, it's all speaking about Christ. And it's speaking about the fact that the Messiah had to suffer. See, they, the Jews couldn't get that concept into their head, could they? How could this the Messiah, the one that was going to come and rule and reign, how could he be a suffering Messiah? They couldn't quite grasp that reality and yet Paul takes them back into the Old Testament scriptures and he reveals to them that and he shows to them that the Christ ultimately will reign and ultimately will be the king and he'll establish a kingdom but prior to that they would be suffering and Paul reveals that to them and he says that he would be suffer he says and then he would rise from the dead Paul always makes a point doesn't he of getting to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ we discover that when he goes down to Berea. We discover it again when he's in Athens. He gets to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's key in the Christian message, isn't it? I read an article the other day, and it was saying that some modern theologian was, was saying that Christians needed to get away from the concept of, 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 of the resurrection. And it just made us look silly, and it, and it made us look as if we were gullible. If we get away from the resurrection, we've got no message to preach at all. There's no basis for our faith. There's no basis for our hope. If we take away the resurrection, Paul was quick to get men and women's attention to the resurrection. And brothers and sisters, we need to hold fast to the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't make sense back then either. Dead men don't rise again. That's not a, that's not a concept that is new for modern mankind. It didn't make sense to them either, but it was a reality that Christ Jesus rose again. And brothers and sisters, we need to hold fast to that. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul reasons with them from the scriptures. And he debates and he, and, and he engages with his audience. And his audience has open dialect with him. And he points them to the scriptures. And, and he points through the scriptures to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he presents it, uh, the evidence before him. He opens the scripture, and he lets the scriptures do their own work. He lets the scriptures do their own work. Brothers and sisters, that's what we need to do. We need to present men and women with the facts. We need to open scripture before them. We need to present the evidence, and then allow the evidence to do its own work. Dad talked last week about the, uh, about the, the, the risks of coercing people into belief uh, and coercing people into faith. We, we just need to present the facts. We need to open the scriptures. We need to present the evidence and allow the evidence to persuade men itself. And that's what happens in verse four. People are persuaded. And some of them are persuaded and they join the apostle Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. There's a response to the message, isn't there? And again, dad highlighted that point last week. But every time Paul preaches, there's a response. There is a response. There's either an acceptance of it or a rejection of it. And, 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 you know, there's not this kind of apathetic response. There was either a mighty work done or a, or, or a mighty riot unfold. And that's what we have here in Thessalonica. We have a, we have a, 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 a revival in a sense in that there were many of the, the Jews responded in faith and they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour, that they accepted the evidence that was presented to them in scriptures. They believed in the resurrection. They said, Paul, and there was many of them, and there was many of the leading um, Greeks who believed in God, and, and a large number of the of the leading women, and they respond, they respond, and 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 there's revival in their hearts, and and there's there's a group of Christians brought together, but on the other hand, we have 
a riot, don't we? And, you know, Dad said that last week, that, you know, I'd rather have a riot than nothing. And sometimes it almost seems as if our preaching produces nothing, just an apathetic approach to things, just a kind of nicety. And, and it was a nice message, and it was, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a good message. And, you know, Paul's messages weren't treated like that. You know, they provoked a response in people's hearts. They changed people, or they produced a riot in the cities that he went to. And here in Thessalonica, it was no different. And there's a group of people, and they respond, and, and, and they're saved, and, the, and the, the, the evidence is presented, and the, the evidence does its own work. The scripture does its own work, and, and it brings uh, these individuals to a knowledge of faith in Jesus Christ. And there are others who are jealous of that. And, and they are hate, hateful of that. And, and they go and they gather some um, wicked men from the marketplace, unruly men, yobs, for want of a better word. And, and they go down there and they set a mob against the city and they set the, the city in an uproar. And, and, and they're determined to get a hold of Paul and Silas uh, in order that they might um, oppress them and in order that they might suppress them. And, and, and this riot takes place, a riot. That is the response to the work of God. The enemy responds with, with a riot against it, and seeking to oppress uh, these, um, these men and the work that they're doing in Thessalonica. And they can't find Paul and Silas, and they come looking for them, and they can't find them in verse 6, but they find one of these new converts, Jason, uh, and some of the other converts, some of the other brethren, and they bring them before the city authorities and they shout that these men who have upset the world, or the King James Version says that they've turned the world upside down, that they have come here also. What a compliment to the work of Paul and Silas. Men who had turned the world upside down. What a reputation. You know, I wonder, brothers and sisters, what kind of reputation have we got in our communities today? I challenged my own heart. Half the community in Oakley probably don't even know I lived here. You know, there was no denying it. When Paul and Silas were present in a place, things happened. Either revivals broke out or riots broke out. The world was turned upside down where these men preached. They had a reputation that went before them. Brothers and sisters, what kind of reputation have we got? Have we got a reputation that where we go, things happen? Have we got a reputation that where we go, the world is turned upside down? The reality is this, brothers and sisters, what Paul and Silas were actually doing was turning the world the right way up. It was upside down. They, the, the world had turned its back on God. It had turned its back on the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the wrong way up. And Paul and Silas are there bringing the message of salvation, bringing the message of hope in order that the world might be turned the right way up again. And these men say, say they've come and they've turned the world upside down. What a reputation as they go in the power of the Holy Spirit and with the word of God in their hands and they go from city to city and they see a work done and they see things established and they see the whole world uh, turned upside down. What a reputation, what a compliment. I'm quite sure these men didn't mean it as a compliment, but what a compliment to these, uh, these apostles and preachers that they had literally taken and they had turned the world upside down. Brothers and sisters, I wonder what impact to be having. Individually, what impact are we having in our communities as churches? What impact are we having in Auckland Lake? What impact are we having? Are we there uh, responsible for turning Auckland Lake upside down or right way up? But I wonder, brothers and sisters, are we just kind of slinked into the background and there's almost as if we're not there at all? You know, these men were at the very front of it, weren't they? Their reputation preceded them and they go. Not only that, but they also remind them of the message that they bring. And they're trying to stir up trouble and they're trying to cause a bit of an insurrection against the Romans and they say they're preaching about Jesus as a king. You know, brothers and sisters, I wonder if we've lost the reality of that teaching today. Jesus is king. And I know we all anticipate and look forward to the day of future when he is king and when he comes and he sets up his kingdom here on earth. But, you know, I wonder if the principle of that is, is lost upon us now that he is our king, that he is our sovereign, that we, we ought to bow to him, we ought to be under his authority, we ought to be under his instruction. 
And these men, while they're trying to be derogatory, they actually highlight that Paul and, Paul and Silas are, are men who are turning the world upside down, and they actually highlight to the Christian church that, that, that there is a king, that Christ is king, he's a sovereign. And right now he, he longs to have that role in our lives, he's the king of our lives, king of our hearts. And so they bring, they bring Jason and some of these others eh, along because they can't find Paul and Silas. Now, you know, it's interesting. We don't know an awful lot about Jason. We're just introduced to him here, but we can understand from what we read here that he was hospitable. It tells us in verse 7 that he welcomed them into his home. What a privilege eh, to, to, to provide hospitality to the servants of God. And that's, again, just a wee throwaway comment, brothers and sisters, that we're hospitable Christians. I know we're restricted just now in who we can have in our homes, and I appreciate that, but but I wonder, brothers and sisters, when the time allows, will we be hospitable with what God has given us? Will we bring people into our homes? Will we harbour the servants of God? Will we bring, will provide for them a place of reprieve? Will we provide hospitality to our friends and to our neighbours? You know, it's a wonderful thing to use what God has given us for his glory. I think back to Luke chapter 10. We remember Martha and Mary. They welcomed Jesus into their home. I think of Rahab way back in the Old Testament and James commends her for it in, in James chapter 2 when it says she welcomed the spies into her home. She provided a place of safety and a place of uh, recluse for them. I think of the exhortation of Hebrews chapter 13 that we have to entertain uh, strangers because in so doing that some of us will entertain angels unawares. Brothers and sisters, Jason was hospitable, he brought these men into his home, he welcomed them, he provided for them. And brothers and sisters, I wonder, are we, uh, are we as, as um, happy to use our homes for God's work and for God's people as what James was? He was reliable, wasn't he? You know, he was loyal. You know, it's, it's all evident that they knew where Paul and Silas were. It's evident because we come down through the next verses in verse 10, it says they sent them away, so they knew where they were. But, but they were dependable. They weren't about to sell them out. They weren't about to, uh, to, about to again give Paul and Silas into the hands of these, uh, this angry mob. They, they weren't about to, 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 uh, to avoid any form of, of uh, hostility themselves and, and, and just throw, as it were, um, Paul and Silas to the dogs. No, they, they were loyal. They were loyal. Again, it comes back to this whole concept of esteeming other better than themselves. And, 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 and you know, Jason and, and these other men, you know, rather than uh, rather than, than sell Paul and Silas out, they, they remained loyal to them. They remained loyal to them. And they would rather have suffered than to have been responsible for allowing their brothers to suffer. And, and, and they were dependable as well, wasn't he? He makes this pledge, doesn't he? Uh, the... Verse 9, it says they'd received a pledge from Jason and the others and they released them. They, a monetary pledge, they paid a bond in order for their freedom. And, and part of that was a monetary bond, but, but part of it was a pledge to say that these men would be, would be removed from Thessalonica in order that there would be no further riots. See, the last thing they wanted was the, uh, the full force of Rome coming to Thessalonica to sort out a riot. And, and so Jason, rightly or wrongly, makes a pledge uh, and, and, and makes the pledge that, that Paul and Silas will go and, and, and go without really any intention of ever being able to come back again. And, 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 you know, we don't know if that was the right or the wrong decision. You know, Paul obviously had it in his heart to, to go back into Thessalonica. We read that in, in the little book of, of First Thessalonians as he writes to them. And he's no longer in a position where he can come and, and uh, commune with them face to face and, and teach them face to face. And he does it by, by writing to them. But he has that desire in his heart. He says he longs to come, but he says Satan has hindered us. Satan has hindered us. The pledge had been made, uh, and Jason had come good on his on his word, uh, and and these men had been sent out and sent out without ever having really the opportunity to return, lest there should have been an uproar and a riot. Uh, and so Paul is 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 uh, not given the opportunity to visit Thessalonica again uh, under these circumstances, and he writes to them. He writes to them. And he, and he encourages them by his written word. You know, Paul is not going to be hindered. The work of God is going to go. And he might not be there physically. He might not be there to sit in their homes and to share fellowship face to face. But he's going to write to them. He's going to share his thoughts. He's going to share his heart with them. 
He's going to instruct them. He's going to encourage them. He's going to build them up. And we read that as we read through the, the two little epistles to the Thessalonians. He encourages them. And he, up, he lifts them up. And where there might have been a door that was closed to his physical presence there in Thessalonica, there was another means whereby he could minister to them. And brothers and sisters, sometimes we've got to look for alternatives, haven't we? And that's really what we've had to do over these recent months, haven't we? We've had to look for alternatives. We're prohibited from meeting together. We're prohibited from sharing and fellowship. Uh, physical fellowship one way or another and we're not able to sit face to face but we have but we have got to find alternatives in order that we might provide encouragement and in order that we might provide um, uplifting um, and, and blessing on, on, on each another and so we're thankful for the resources that we do have that make it possible whether it be the written word as we perhaps write uh, encouragement whether it's text messages whether it's emails whether it's letters or whether it's the, the, the facilities we have to use this afternoon, the Zoom and Microsoft Teams and, and these other uh, platforms that are available to us to, to minister to the needs. We need to adapt. We need to adapt. And, and you know, perhaps there's an element we don't want to adapt. We just want things to stay the same. You know, for Paul, it was taken out with his control. He had to leave this, he had to leave Thessalonica. Uh, and he had to go because Jason had paid the pledge and he had said that they would go. And he has to look for an alternative. And he finds an alternative in the written word and he encourages them. And we have, we're the recipients of that now. The inspired word of God, centuries later, we're, we're able to, to benefit from the words that he wrote to that little church there in Thessalonica. And so we have the release of Jason in verse 9. And then they have the, the removal of Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And back to the same place, back to the routine. The work of God goes on. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's an encouragement, isn't it? And I had hoped to get further down the chapter than that. I'd hope to look at Berea and look at Thessal and um, Athens, but um, we can cover that another, uh, another day. But, but they're there, they're removed. They're removed. But, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Paul writes in, uh, in First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 17, he says, But we, brethren, have been taken away from you, for a short while, he says, in person, but not in spirit, but all the more eager with desire, great desire to see your face, to see your face. And Paul says, look, we're away physically. They're removed physically, but they're not in spirit. Their spirits are still in, in Thessalonica. And brothers and sisters, we've been removed from one another. And as a local church, we, we, we haven't met together for months. And all our communication has been done on a screen. And surely that has just placed within us this same desire that, that, that Paul had, that we've got a more eager, with a greater desire to see, to see your faces. Paul had a desire to see the faces of the Thessalonian believers, having had to have been removed from the situation, removed from the city. And brothers and sisters, I wonder this afternoon, have we got that same desire in our hearts? As we await with anticipation the day when we are able to meet again, and we're able to be in fellowship with one another, in, in physical uh, proximity with one another, without all the prohibitions that are placed upon us currently, but when we can sit together and share a meal together, when we can shake hands, when we can hug, when we can embrace, when we can sit together collectively under the teaching of God's word, when we can be together collectively in the evangelization of our communities. Brothers and sisters, there's a heart's longing for it because Paul's heart longed for it. He'd been taken away for a short time but he says in person only, not in spirit. I wonder, brothers and sisters, where are our hearts lying today? Do they lie with the little groups of Christians that we represent on this call this afternoon? Do they lie with our brothers and sisters? Is our spirit yearning to be with them? And I know that our physical bodies would, would be with them as well, but is our spirit with them? And I wonder, are we eager with great desire? to see their face. That was Paul's desire for the Thessalonians. He was only there for a short period of time, wasn't he? Only there to see the work of God established and to see a church planted. And yet that little group of Christians had such an impact on his life. They shared in his tribulation and he, and he longed after them. And brothers and sisters, I trust that as we go through this period of lockdown, prolonged period of lockdown, that indeed our desire might be to be indeed with those who we love and those who we're in fellowship with. And so we thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you just for uh, these few thoughts. Prayer may be an encouragement 
Uh, as I say, we didn't quite cover all that we'd expected to cover, but we pray that it may have been a blessing. We'll just close with a word of prayer. Father, as we come into your presence, we come to you in the name of the 